Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last two lectures of EC3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at common emitter amplifiers and common collector amplifiers. In this lecture, we will complete this new trilogy and look at common base amplifiers. As in the last two lectures, we will use a set of Norton and Thevenin equivalents developed by my colleague Marshall Leach. We derived these equivalent circuits in an earlier trilogy, and you can find them summarized on the BJT formula sheet on Professor Leach's website. Okay, so here's an example of a common base amplifier configuration using voltage divider bias that's being provided by R1 and R2 here. Now, in the last lecture, the emitter of the BJT was providing the output. Here, the emitter is being used as an input, and the collector is acting as the output. I've included an RS here to model the non-ideal impedance of whatever voltage source is driving the amplifier. I'm also including RL here as an external load. I don't have to include RL in this analysis, but it's just as easy to include it, so why not? RS is important to include in terms of really understanding what's going on, though. All right, so the actual amplifier itself is considered to be this stuff here. The capacitors here allow us to block DC and set some DC bias voltages at these points that are different than what's outside of the amplifier. And here we have this capacitor kindly providing a small signal path to ground at the base, justifying the name common base amplifier. As usual, we decompose our amplifier into a DC bias circuit and a small signal, aka AC circuit. And for the DC circuit, we open up all of the capacitors, so we basically take these out. And for the small signal circuit, for now we're going to assume that the capacitors are acting as shorts. And later in the class, I'll show you more delicate ways of dealing with the capacitors that will allow us to explore their effect on the frequency response. All right, so the DC bias circuit here is the same as what we had for the common emitter and common collector amplifiers. So we're able to reuse this slide for the third time. And you can use this formula here to figure out what the bias current for the collector is, and then use your alpha and beta relationships to figure out what the associated currents are for the emitter or base if you need those. Notice that the collector current here doesn't depend on what RC is. Now, RC is important in terms of checking to make sure that the BJT is operating in the active mode. And remember, all of the work we're doing here assumes that the transistor is in the active mode. So these slides are ones that I've shown before. And if you haven't already seen my lecture on voltage divider biasing, you should go back and check that out. The details of that aren't too important right now. You can just assume that you've computed IC and go through with the rest of the lecture. Anyway, once you have the DC bias currents, you can plug them into our formulas for the small signal parameters. So we have the raw input and output impedances of the BJT. We have the raw emitter resistance of the BJT, and we have the raw transconductance gain of the BJT. So you plug in your capital I's, and you get these numbers, and we'll use these numbers in the remaining slides. So we're going to use a Norton equivalent looking into the collector to figure out the gain and the output impedance, and we're going to use a Thevenin equivalent looking into the emitter to figure out the input impedance. And in order to use those equivalents, we're going to need some Thevenin equivalents looking out of the terminals. So the Norton equivalent associated with looking into the collector is going to need Thevenin equivalents looking out of the base and out of the emitter. And the Thevenin equivalent looking into the emitter is going to need the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base. So let me replace all the stuff over here. Well, there isn't very much over there. And all the stuff down here with some Thevenin equivalent circuits. Now, the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base is pretty straightforward. We have a Thevenin voltage of zero 
and a 7 in resistance of 0, but put a pin in this. I'll come back to this issue in a second. Remember that when we're computing a 7 in equivalent, we essentially disconnect the line here. So the voltage we'll see at the emitter is just the result of a voltage divider. So I have RS plus RE, and I'm dividing the voltage down RE, so RE goes in the numerator. Now, to compute the Thevenin voltage looking out, I need to zero out the independent voltage source, and then that is just a parallel combination of my source resistance with my choice of emitter resistor. Now, I mentioned I would come back to this point here. Something I haven't mentioned previously is sometimes people like to soup up their small signal model by adding a small resistance called the base spreading resistance in series with the base. And basically, it involves taking a small resistance Rx, this base spreading resistance, and adding it in series with whatever Thevenin equivalent you see looking out here. So you could imagine writing something like, okay, well, I have a new Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base, and that's Rx plus my original RTB. And I probably should have grabbed the graphics tablet for this, but that's a pain. So I'm writing this with a mouse, which is probably not a great idea. Anyway, Rx is not really external to the transistor. It is part of the transistor. All of your original hybrid Pi model stuff is still the same, except you sort of have a new internal base that you're computing everything relative to. But it's just as easy to imagine that this Rx is external to your existing hybrid Pi model. So if you need little Rx, just add it to RTB and you'll be fine. So in the remaining slides, I'm going to leave RTB in the expressions. If you don't have base spreading resistance, that's just zero and all the formulas simplify. But if you do have Rx, you can just set RTB equal to Rx and you're off to the races. All right, so let's compute the gain. What we'll do is we'll take all of the stuff down here and replace it all with our Norton equivalent circuit looking into the collector. So the actual voltage we see at the output can be computed the same way we did for the common emitter amplifier. It's just our short circuit current for the collector. It's this voltage controlled current source right here. And we're turning that current into a voltage with this parallel combination of RC, RL, and our Norton resistance, RIC. Now, what is IC? Well, in general, we had a formula like GM times VBE minus VTE. But here, VBE is equal to zero. So we can wind up just saying, okay, it's just minus GM times VTE. Okay, what's VTE? Well, VTE is going to equal our source resistance through this voltage divider. That's something we've talked about already. And now I can pile all of these expressions together and write VO equals VS times this mess. Now, of course, I can combine these minus signs and get rid of them, but in terms of understanding how the amplifier works, I find it helpful to leave them in this form for the moment. All right, so let's divide both sides of this expression by Vs to compute our small signal voltage gain AV. And at this point, I'll go ahead and take these minus signs and combine them to write this expression here. So the Mason flow graph for this is pretty simple. We can imagine multiplying by this voltage divider in order to get the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the emitter. And then we just multiply by minus GM to get the short circuit collector current. And then I need to turn that current back into a voltage with Ohm's law by multiplying by the set of resistances. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention. We know we need to put a minus here because the arrow shows that we're pulling current out of the node. All right, so let's remind ourselves what big GM and little r IC are. For big GM, we have five different formulas to choose from. For RIC, we have two different formulas to choose from. One of the formulas for RIC 
involves this RIE, for which we have a choice of two different expressions down here. For this particular amplifier we're analyzing, the one with RE is particularly convenient. So let us remind ourselves that RTE is this parallel combination of the source resistance and our emitter resistor. And if we don't have any base spreading resistance, i.e. we don't need to set RTB equal to some little RX, then this term here goes away and RIE is just RE. So we could get rid of the I's here. And also, if RTB is equal to zero, then a bunch of these terms here simplify because this goes away, this goes away, this goes away. Let's see what else. This would wind up going away. Let's see. This would go away. This would go away. Anyway, things would simplify quite a bit if RTB equals zero. Okay, so let's calculate the output impedance seen looking into this junction of the collector and our collector resistor. So, notice this does not include RL, our external load, that's not considered part of the amp itself. So, we'll use our Norton equivalent circuit once again, and when we're computing an output resistance, we zero out our independent sources, and zeroing this voltage source effectively zeroes out our voltage-controlled current source, and so looking into the terminal here, we just see RC in parallel with little rIC. We have two expressions for little rIC. This is one of them. You can look up the other one on the previous slide. And if we don't have any base spreading resistance, we can set RTB to zero. So this goes away and this goes away. And if you do have some base spreading resistance, you could just plug Rx into for RTB here. No big deal. Anyway, what about RTE? Well, remember that's RS in parallel with RE. Note that if we could approximate R0 as being infinite, RIC would be infinite, and then R out would be just our choice of resistor at the collector. Okay, so what's the input impedance seen looking into the junction of the emitter and our emitter resistor. Notice we're not including our S in the input impedance. That's not considered part of the amplifier. That's part of the source that's driving the amplifier. All right, so for this, we'll use our Thevenin equivalent circuit looking up into the emitter. If there was a voltage source out here, then we would have some Thevenin voltage source here, but we don't, so we don't. So we just see two resistances in parallel. We have RE in parallel with little r IE. So remember little r IE has two possible expressions. This one is probably the most natural since we're looking into the emitter. If you have some base spreading resistance, you could replace RTB with little r X. But if you don't, RTB is equal zero and this goes away. And then the input impedance is just big R E in parallel with little re. Now, this is a main problem with the common base configuration. Little re is usually pretty small, at least smaller than we would like it to be. So the input resistance to this amplifier is low. And remember, for a voltage input, we would like the input impedance to be high. So you don't see common base amplifiers sort of used by themselves very often in the wild. They usually appear as part of analyzing a more complicated multi-stage amplifier structure. So this formula here is a bit of a handful. Let's look at a special case. Let's suppose the source resistance is zero and the load resistance and raw output resistance of the transistor are both infinite. These resistances being infinite means that this parallel combination reduces to just RC, and RS equals zero means this term goes away, means that this term goes to one, and then I wind up with GM times RC, or I should clarify big GM times RC. Now, remember RTE is our emitter resistor RE in parallel with RS, our source resistance. And if that's zero, then this is zero. And also, if we assume that we don't have any base spreading resistance, this is zero. So our big GM is just equal to our little GM, and our formula for the gain simplifies to our raw transconductance, 
times RC.